Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Paul Harrison, and it is my um, pleasure and privilege on behalf of the Ho Centre for Buddhist Studies at Stanford to welcome the Reverend Marvin Harada, Bishop of the Buddhist Churches of America, to deliver this year's TT and WF Chow Distinguished Buddhist Practitioner Lecture on the subject of the past, present, and future of the Buddhist Churches of America. Uh, when I call um, the Reverend Harada the Reverend, uh, Reverend seems a little bit light in terms of honorific um, punch for a bishop. I was brought up in the Anglican Communion, in which bishops are sometimes called his grace. But after the Game of Thrones, that sounds a little bit over the top. Um, so I'll just have to be content with the Reverend. The Reverend Harada was born in Ontario, Oregon, and grew up on the family farm in the eastern part of that state. He began his education at the University of Oregon, earning a BA in Religious Studies, thus providing to us welcome proof of the kind we always like to see that a degree in religious studies does lead to employment. <laughs> <laughs> he went on to do a, a master's degree in Buddhist studies at the Institute of Buddhist Studies across the Bay, from which, incidentally, we welcome several faculty members this evening, Professors Paula Arai, uh, Nancy Lin, and Chan Ching Han, uh, all here today. Welcome. The Reverend Harada then completed another master's degree at Ryukoku University in Kyoto, with which the Institute for Buddhist Studies is affiliated, as well as studying for several years at Chuo Kyogakuin, the central Shin Buddhist seminary established in Kyoto at Nishi Honganji over 100 years ago. From 1986 to 2020, he was the head minister at the Orange County Buddhist Church in Anaheim, California. And looking it up earlier today, I was surprised to see that the BCA has 41 temples, if I count them correctly, in California alone. The Reverend Harada became Bishop of the BCA on April the 1st, 2020, an accession date, which I imagine is the occasion for some light-hearted joking <laughs> among the BCA hierarchy. I know some of them personally, and I know they like a good joke, um, one of the many endearing things about them. But that date is also not so amusing because it was, when, it was then when the pandemic was uh, getting underway. So the Reverend Harada has had to shepherd the BCA through uh, the pandemic, which we know has not been an easy time. Sorry, I'm, am I pressing things that I should? <laughs> <laughs> More than 20 years ago, and I'll hold off there, I did some intensive research into what was then the oldest surviving literary evidence for Pure Land Buddhism. The first Chinese translation of the larger Sukhavati Yuha by the indo scythian missionary Lokakshema. That is research that is still unpublished, despite frequent reminders from my highly significant other. But I learned then, doing that research, how interesting and important the Pure Land strain of Buddhism is. And it has also been uh, vigorous, endlessly creative, and long-lived. And I've also come to understand, by the way, that it is not at all simple, as some people might think. So it is a great pleasure this evening to have here one of its contemporary exponents and the leader of one of the most important organizations devoted to its propagation in North America, the Buddhist Churches of America, which will celebrate its 125th anniversary in 2024 next year. So uh, Reverend Harada, a warm welcome to Stanford and the podium is yours. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Dr. Harrison. 
Uh, it's such a pleasure and honor to be asked to speak here at prestigious Stanford University uh, as part of the Ho Center for Buddhist Studies uh, program. Uh, I was trying to think if I had some kind of personal connection with Stanford University. As he mentioned, I went to the University of Oregon, so I'm a duck. And the only thing I could think of was that when John Elway played for Stanford, I used to root for Stanford instead of Oregon. <laughs> so that's my closest personal affinity with Stanford University. Uh, you shouldn't be too impressed by the academic background uh, that he shared, because to be honest, in the eighth grade, uh, I went to, well, I went to a small rural elementary school in Eastern Oregon. There were 25 students in the whole school, not one class. So in my class, there were just two of us, myself and one, one other girl. Her name was Mary Lou Coleman. Easy to remember your classmate's name when you only have one classmate. In the eighth grade, I graduated salutatorian, which is second highest <laughs> in your class, but out of a class of two. <laughs> but I did go on to University of Oregon and Institute of Buddhist Studies and uh, became a minister. And it's been a tremendously rewarding and fulfilling a life and career for me. So I'd like to uh, go into my talk. Let me kind of go back. So I've been asked to speak on the past, present, and future of our Buddhist churches of America. So I'd like to start with this image. So this is a map that shows how Buddhism has spread throughout the Asian continent. And you know, the little white circle is where Buddhism began in northern India. And over the course of centuries and centuries, it goes to the north, into China, Korea, Japan. It goes through to the south, through southern India, Sri Lanka, over to Thailand, Vietnam. And, and so I'd like us to keep this image of this map in mind. We'll return to it towards the end of my talk. Oops. This is another image I like to start out with. This is one of my favorite places to visit in Kyoto, the Kiyomizu Dera, Temple of Pure Water. Magnificent temple built on these wooden stilts, sort of, on this steep hillside. Just magnificent. And we'll return to this picture, too, later on. So I'd like to start with the past the Buddhist Churches of America, our past. So the BCA begins when two ministers, Reverend Shue Sonoda and Reverend Kakuryo Nishijima, in 1899, are sent from Japan, from our mother temple, the Nishihonganji in Kyoto, to serve the Shin Buddhists that had immigrated to this country. The head of our Honganji at that time was Myonyo Shoni, and he was the one to appoint Reverend Sonoda and Nishijima to serve you know, overseas. The San Francisco Chronicle ran an article in the newspaper then. This is dated September 13, 1899. Two new Buddhist missionaries have arrived in San Francisco, and pictures of Reverend Sonoda and Reverend Nishijima. The BCA began with the earliest bishops who served, Bishop Sonoda, Bishop Mizuki, and Bishop Hori. We have a former bishop present here tonight, too, with Reverend Umezu. In 1937, they began to build a new structure in San Francisco to establish the Buddhist Church of San Francisco. And 
to house the headquarters for the Buddhist mission of North America. This is before it was called the BCA. And for the sacred relics. So the sacred relics, we'll go to this picture next. The king of Siam uh, gave to the BCA the holy relics of Shakyamuni Buddha, meaning you know, an ash remnant of the historical Buddha. I mean, a tremendous, tremendous gift uh, to help in bringing Buddhism to this country. So, uh, in order to respectfully house such important relics, a new building for the Buddhist Church of San Francisco and a stupa on top of the building to house the holy relics or the ashes of Shakyamuni Buddha uh, was built. This is 1938 or somewhere around there. That's the construction phase. And this was completed then, yeah, 1938, Buddhist Church of San Francisco. Still located on Pine and Octavia. So from that early 1900s, many churches and temples began to be established. Uh, the Sacramento, Buddhist Church of Sacramento, was founded in 1899, just shortly after the two ministers came from Japan. Uh, this particular building here was uh, constructed in 1959, but the Buddhist Church of Sacramento itself was founded as early as 1899. Fresno Buddhist Church, first formed in 1901, at this particular building in 1920. Uh, this building now uh, is a, uh, let's see, it's been, it was sold to another Buddhist group. Uh, uh, let's see, what ethnicity was that? Uh, Burmese? 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 Burmese or Cambodian Buddhists now occupy this building and Fresno built a, a new uh, sanctuary. This is the Seattle Buddhist Church. First temple was built in 1908 and this particular building in 1941. San Jose Buddhist Church, not far from here. First church was built in 1907. This pr present building uh, in the picture in 1937. It looks pretty much like this you know, today, right there in downtown San Jose. And the Los Angeles Hompa Honganji Buddhist Temple was first established in 1904. And the building in this picture, uh, built in 1969. You know, many of those early churches and temples, they were literally built by the hands of the members. This is my home temple in Eastern Oregon, where I grew up and our family attended the Idaho Oregon Buddhist Temple. It's called Idaho Oregon Buddhist Temple because it's on the border of Oregon and Idaho. So many of the members, some live in Idaho, some live in Oregon, and it's located in small town of uh, East uh, Ontario, Oregon. Uh, and this structure was built in 1958, 1958. When they built this structure, they hired one carpenter and the rest of the labor was all the members. They're all farmers. So they built it in the wintertime. In Eastern Oregon, it's too cold to farm in the wintertime. So during the winter vacation, all the farmers built this temple. One carpenter telling other, do this, do that. And all the labor was provided by the members. My own uncle broke his arm because he fell off a ladder during the construction of, of this temple. And this is commonplace in, in almost all of our churches and temples throughout the, the United States, literally built by the hands of the members. This is the Oakland Buddhist Church, downtown Oakland, built in 1927. So in the first 10 years of our BCA history, Churches and branches were established in San Francisco, Sacramento, Fresno, 
Vacaville, Seattle, San Jose, Oakland, Portland, Los Angeles, White River, Washington, Placer, California, Watsonville, Stockton, Hanford, in Central Cal, Guadalupe, Bakersfield, San Mateo, Marysville, Lodi, and Fowler, just in those first 10 years. And in 1914, there were 25 churches and branches established. And in 1931, we have these following figures, 33 churches, but some of the larger churches had branch temples underneath it, uh, 59 ministers, 11,000 family members, 300 Sunday school teachers, we call it Dharma school now, uh, 6,800 Sunday school students, Fujinkai or the Buddhist Women's Association, you know, 3,300, and YBA or the high school age group, 1,800. Of course, World War II brought a halt to the growth of the BCA and the building of new churches and temples as uh, all Japanese Americans were sent to uh, internment camps. But that internment camp brought together Buddhist ministers and lay followers of various Buddhist traditions into one place where they continued their, their Buddhist faith with services held in camp. And I think this really influenced RBCA as from that point on, they tried to be inclusive of all types of Buddhists. You know, they didn't, in an internment camp, they didn't have, okay, this is a Zen service, this is a Tendai service, this is a Shingon service, this is now the Shin, Jodo Shinshu service. They had one, one Buddhist service and many ministers of various traditions and uh, lay members of various Buddhist traditions would share in a Buddhist service together. So I think that influenced our, our pioneering BCA members, such that they would choose as the name of the organization Buddhist Churches of America instead of you know, Nishi Honganji or something uh, more sectarian. Here uh, it's a picture of Reverend Nagatomi conducting a dedication of the Ireto Memorial, which was in memory, memory of all who, who died uh, during internment camp. And this photo is from uh, the wonderful book by Duncan Williams. Ministers were sent to uh, separate camps, and so they were segrega segregated from their families and their sanghas. So in many cases, uh, the lay members did not have the spiritual leadership uh, of their own ministers. So during the war, in the internment camps, a major change occurred in the history of the BCA. And referring again to the wonderful book by Duncan Williams from USC, American Sutra, he writes, at the Topaz internment camp, Bishop Dōtai Matsukage and Nisei minister Reverend Kenyo Kumata drafted the reorganization of the Buddhist mission of North America to the new name, the Buddhist Churches of America, which cut its ties to their mother temple in Kyoto, Japan, and set grounds to be governed by a Nisei, second generation, run board, with English as the official language. And this was adopted by representatives from the various internment camps in a democratic process, which Americanized the BCA, which uh, leaders felt would enable the BCA, its churches and temples, to be accepted into the general public. You know, so in this climate of war with Japan and tremendous uh, racial discrimination and prejudice against Japanese, uh, Japanese Americans, they wanted to help Buddhism become more mainstream, to be accepted by the uh, American uh, public and for our own Buddhists to be able to live uh, a life uh, peacefully with others who were not Buddhist. So they adopted words and terminology like Buddhist Churches of America, Reverend, Bishop, uh, and, and that was uh, how the terminology got started. Now we're at the point now where I think we need to question whether it's time to maybe change some of our names and terminology because maybe it is not uh, sort of attractive to the newcomer. You know, I always fear that someone might go to the, the website 
find us in a Buddhist churches of America. What kind of Buddhism is that? And, and you know, they might just not even check into us any further just because they think that church is a sort of a, uh, maybe a, a strange Buddhist group. As a minister, one day I was at, in our office and uh, a very devout Christian individual stopped by and said to me, you have to change the name. He said, church means house of God. This is not a house of God. You have to change the name. This is not a church. I said, well, I couldn't give him the whole history of the BCA, <laughs> but uh, I, I understood what he was trying to say. So after the war, Churches and temples resumed their religious and social activities, and the BCA continued to thrive for the next uh, 20 to 30 years. In 1974, when the BCA celebrated its 75th anniversary, we had at that time 55 churches, which included some uh, satellite or branch temples. We had 62 ministers, and we had uh, about 20,000 members. These are some pictures from our 75th anniversary that was held in San Francisco. Uh, a huge, huge event. And it was held in conjunction with the 5th World Buddhist Women's Convention. And the head of our uh, Hongganji at that time, the Gomonshu, and his wife uh, attended uh, that convention. So in the first 75 years of the BCA, we had also numerous affiliate organizations that were established at each church and temple. A women's Association, we call the BWA. Adult Buddhist Association, we call the ABBA. Dharma schools and Dharma school teachers, youth organizations, and various cultural classes, Judo, Kendo, Ikebana, Bonsai, Japanese language schools. Uh, I served at Orange County Buddhist Church at one time, the Japanese language school had nearly 600 students in the Japanese language. The, the temple was really built with the, the Japanese language school. So there was you know, a huge uh, Japanese American community at that time. Part of our BCA history is also the history of the Institute of Buddhist Studies, uh, which is a graduate school of the BCA that educates and trains you know, our ministers. So I'd like to reflect a little bit about the past of the IBS. It started out as the Buddhist Study Center, located at the Berkeley Buddhist Temple. And that was the, the, the start of the Institute of Buddhist Studies in 1949. Then in 1966, we moved to the building on Hay Street, which is now the dormitory. Uh, and this was IBS for many years. And I went to school there from 1977 to 1980. In 1980, I graduated valedictorian from I IBS <laughs> out of a class of one. <laughs> so you could say I was at the top of my class and at the bottom of my class, both at the same time. I can't believe they had a graduation ceremony for me. I think they were so happy that there was a graduate, you know, so we had a graduation ceremony. The, lo the late Dr. Leo Pruden, maybe some of you might know that name, he, was, he gave the commencement address, and so uh, it was uh, quite an honor. In 1985, IBS becomes affiliated with the Graduate Theological Union. And in 2006, IBS moves into the new BCA facility in Berkeley, the Jodo Shinshu Center. And in 2020, just three years ago, IBS is granted initial accreditation by WASC, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. You know, quite a, uh, a milestone for IBS to receive you know, accreditation. And in 2021, IBS becomes the first non-Christian full member school of the Graduate Theological Union. So that's a part of the IBS history, which is also a very integral to our history of the BCA. Now let's look at the present, our BCA in the present. 
Now we are located, our headquarters has moved from San Francisco to the Jodo Shinshu Center in Berkeley. And this new facility houses not only the BCA headquarters, but the Institute of Buddhist Studies, classes, uh, offices for our faculty. And our faculty now includes, just to, just to name a few, Reverend Dr. David Matsumoto, Dr. Scott Mitchell, Dr. Paula Arai, who's here tonight, Dr. Richard Payne, Dr. Nancy Lin, who's here tonight, Reverend Dr. Takashi Miyagi, Reverend Dr. Mutsumi Wandra, and uh, other uh, numerous faculty members and adjunct faculty. Now we have 50 plus students. Uh, we, we don't have just ministerial students. We have uh, students here studying for chaplaincy. We have GTU students who are preparing for Christian ministry, but they're taking courses on Buddhism at IBS and learning about Buddhism. If I went to IBS now, no way could I graduate valedictorian. <laughs> Too many students in the class. <laughs> and then next year, IBS will celebrate its 75th anniversary. We also have the BCA's uh, Buddhist Education Program, which is called the Center for Buddhist Education. And the Center for Buddhist Education has uh, educational programs, everything from uh, the general layperson, uh, people new to Buddhism, Dharma school teachers, uh, continuing education for ministers, uh, ministers' assistants, training, uh, and numerous uh, education, educational events. The pandemic uh, forced us to become internet ministers and to do things virtually. And so the CBE has uh, many uh, online lectures that anyone can, can watch. We have the one in the middle there, Crossing Over, is actually going to take place this weekend at IBS. For those who have crossed over from other religious traditions to uh, Shin Buddhism. We also have uh, a YouTube channel, as uh, many other religious organizations have. And we have uh, numerous lectures uh, and talks on a variety of subject, uh, subjects on our uh, YouTube channel. And we have many uh, in-person things. We had many more in-person <laughs> events before the pandemic, and now we're uh, getting started having in-person events again. Uh, but we are also doing uh, virtual events as well. So continuing education, lectures for ministers, minister's assistant program, uh, temple leadership seminars, uh, and general lectures. In the year 2000, we created a minister's assistant program, which was to help with the shortage of ministers. Uh, but this program has grown and developed, and many of our full-time ministers today have, they've started out as minister's assistants and gone on to become uh, full-fledged ministers. I think it's one of the most positive programs to come out of the BCA in, in recent decades. Last year, for the very first time, outside of Japan, outside of the Honganji, the second level of ordination, which is called Kyoshi, Kyoshi certification was held at our Jodo Shinshu Center. And uh, 11 individuals, nine from the BCA, one from Canada, and one from Hawaii, uh, underwent this 10-day long intensive retreat. And they uh, learned uh, rituals, had lectures, uh, and uh, completed their second level of ordination called Kyoshi. So it was quite a historic uh, event for all of us in the BCA. So we had just one instructor from the Honganji, but the rest of the instructors were ministers within our BCA and Canada. And we were able to adjust the curriculum for ministers who are going to be serving overseas and not just for ministers who serve in Japan. In Japan. Our Jodo Shinshu Center also houses the Jodo Shinshu International Office. And the person in the picture here, uh, Reverend Kiyonobu Kuhara, is the director of the Jodo Shinshu International Office. So the uh, idea for this came from our Revenue Mezu when he proposed to the Honganji, you know, why don't you let us take care of the international propagation of, of Shin Buddhism? And so that's what this Jodo Shinshu International Office uh, primarily does. 
This is the newest temple structure in our BCA uh, at Fresno. Uh, after many years of fundraising, they built a new hondo, or the main sanctuary, uh, quite a very futuristic, modern design. Uh, the architect was a student of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is the altar inside the new Fresno Hondo. We are finally resuming uh, in-person festivals and fundraisers, and everyone loves uh, our obons at all of our temples throughout the BCA, and some started in person last year, and I think almost all of the uh, t churches and temples will have regular obon uh, festivals this summer. So it's wonderful to get back to these events that we've missed for the past uh, three or four years. Some of our ministers are doing innovative things like podcasts. Uh, Reverend Dr. Takashi Miyagi uh, has, has a podcast that he does in which he talks about you know, Shin Buddhism. During the pandemic, we have many older members that they don't use a computer. So we created a Dial the Dharma in which you call an 800 number. And I have a recorded message, a five minute recorded message. And every week uh, you can listen to a new message. So I do the English one. I ask uh, Japanese speaking ministers to provide recordings for the Japanese speaking Sangha. And now we even have it in Spanish. So press one for English, press two for Japanese, and press three for Spanish. So the pandemic forced all of us to become internet ministers. Years ago, I used to dream, oh, if we could just have one minister that's dedicated towards internet ministry, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> now we all learned, had to learn how to do this. So, uh, the, for example, this is Orange County Buddhist Church where I serve. This is their YouTube channel and their uh, talks and lectures that anyone could watch. Uh, they also created uh, an online study program it's called Everyday Buddhist. And so they have uh, lectures of varying levels uh, to reach uh, new people. So presently in our BCA, we have 58 churches or temples. We have 35 ministers. We have 60 active ministers' assistants, ministers' assistants. And we have 10,368 members. So that is, our, that is our present. And so almost all of our churches and temples are trying to get back to their attendance levels of before the pandemic. But it's a struggle, and I'm sure other religions are facing this as well, to get people to come back to in-person services and gatherings. And I think we did too good of a job to provide live streaming and YouTube services uh, during the pandemic. And it's just so comfortable people to sit in their pajamas and have their cup of coffee and <laughs> watch the service from the comfort of their own home. But we're trying to, get, trying to get people back. So this is a sort of a harsh statistic for all of us in the BCA. In the past 10 years, we've lost 28% of our membership. So when I became the bishop, you know, this is top number one priority. During the pandemic, we had to bend the curve this way, right? They talked about bending the curve. Well, with the BCA, we have to bend the curve the other direction. We have to slow the decline and we have to grow our sanghas. We can't lose 28% of our membership every 10 years, see? Our Nishihonganji in Japan has 10,000 temples, but they expect to lose 3,000 temples in the next 10 years. Not 3,000 members, 3,000 temples they expect to lose. So we could cite many reasons for our membership decline maybe the decline of religious organizations in general, maybe the fact that we were an ethnic church for too long and we didn't reach out to beyond the Japanese American community soon enough, uh, maybe we didn't do enough in terms of Buddhist education to reach new people that we should have done you know, years and years ago, 
you know, maybe were not as appealing as other practice-oriented schools of Buddhism, like Zen or Tibetan Buddhism, perhaps. And obviously, we have not done enough outreach uh, so that people even know that we exist. And something that we have to reflect on ourselves is maybe our way of presenting Shin Buddhism has not resonated with people. So how, how can we address that is, is our challenge. So how do we compare to other Buddhist groups in the United States? I stumbled across this data from this Association of Statisticians of American Religious Bodies. And they even have a book, but this is their 2020 report. And in it, it shows that Zen has over 100,000 followers in this country. Tibetan Buddhism, there's four lineages, but the largest group is the New Kadampa, and they have 20,000 members. So if you figure they have four lineages, they must have about 80,000. Soka Gakkai, you know, uh, everyone heard that Tina Turner uh, just passed away. You know, she was a, a follower of Soka Gakkai. 300,000 members, and predominantly non-Asians. Vietnamese Buddhists, more than 100,000. Thich Nhat Hanh's following, they have more than 400 centers. But some of those centers are, are small groups that meet in homes. So obviously, we're, we don't come close to some of the uh, size of, of other Buddhist groups in this country. Now let's turn to the future. So I'd like to go back to this picture. This picture is why I have absolute confidence in the future of Buddhism in this country. This is the proof, the history. Over the course of centuries, no matter what country that Buddhism entered, in time, it became the predominant religious tradition of that country. And I know that this will occur in this country as well. So someday, even though our country today is what, maybe 95% Judeo-Christian, someday this country will be predominantly Buddhist. It might take 200 years, 300 years. I wish I could see it. I would love to be able to see what it looks like. Buddhist centers or meditation centers or Buddhist temples every other block. You know, but in time it will occur and there will be new, unique American Buddhist traditions. New teachers will emerge, new masters will emerge, just as great teachers emerged in Japan, great teachers emerged when Buddhism went into China. You know, this will occur in this country and unique American Buddhist traditions will arise. So, this image again, Kiyo Mizudera, magnificent temple. It must have been a thriving Buddhist school at one point in time. But it died out. It died out. It didn't reach the general population. It didn't reach the general public. And so as a school of Buddhism, you know, it, it died out. So, as the bishop of the BCA, I don't want our BCA to become like Kiyomizudera. See? To, to just be a museum. We, we want our tradition to be a living school of Buddhism in this country. And so that, that's our challenge uh, for those of us who belong to, to this BCA. So I think Shin Buddhism has a tremendous amount that it can offer this country and to the world. First of all, our tradition doesn't require any kind of monastic lifestyle. It can be followed by anyone, regardless of their age, regardless of their gender, regardless of their ethnicity, and regardless of their sexual orientation. There are many religions that cannot say this. They, they, they simply don't embrace all people, especially of, of all sexual orientation. But it's not an issue in Shin Buddhism at all. 
Shin Buddhism is a life of, of listening to the teachings, listening in our everyday life. That's, that's our main practice, to listen. Listening has become a lost art. You know? Whether it's young people or whether it's we adults. I read an, a fascinating fact. I, was, I checked, I googled, what's the average attention span of a person now? I thought it was going to be like two or three minutes, you know, the length of a commercial. <laughs> That's what I thought it was years. You know what it is now? Attention span is eight and a half seconds. Eight and a half seconds. Goldfish have a longer attention span <laughs> than we human beings. <laughs> So, how can we learn? See, how can we listen? See, so Shin Buddhism, the focus is listening. You know, I talked to a, uh, a Buddhist counselor. He was a marriage counselor. And I asked him, well, what's unique about Buddhist marriage counseling? He says, well, in normal marriage counseling, you tell a couple, you need to talk more. You need to communicate more. She says, I tell the couples, you need to shut up and listen. <laughs> no one's listening. No one's, that's, why, that's why you're not communicating. That's why you're not understanding each other. So, Shin Buddhism teaches us how to listen. How to listen. If we can listen to the Dharma, then we can listen to our husbands or our wives or our children or our parents. And I'm the most guilty of that. You know, my wife always catches me. She's talking to me, she's, and I'm going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then she stops and she says, what did I just say? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so we are nurtured in listening. Shin Buddhism is a life of gratitude. Psychologists are now saying that grateful people are really the happiest people. Well, Shin Buddhism, we've been teaching this for centuries. Centuries. Gratitude is at the core of, of being a fulfilled, happy person. There is an amazing Shin Buddhist woman. I hope that the general public will know about her someday. Her name is Hisako Nakamura. She's the Helen Keller of Japan. She lived her, almost her entire life without any hands or without any feet. She lost them due to frostbite as, as a young two or three year old. So she lived this tremendously difficult life. No hands, no feet. She encounters Shin Buddhism and she shares poems like this. You know, I have everything, I have everything I need in life. How can someone without any hands or feet say they have everything, see? But even someone like Hisako Nakamura lives a life of gratitude. Shin Buddhism teaches us to, to live a life of humility, a life of looking up to others and to all things. And that is the most strongest, powerful life. You've all heard that the willow tree or the bamboo tree is really the stronger tree than the oak tree. If the oak tree is too stiff, and so it will break in a wind, in the wind, but the willow or the bamboo is flexible and is really stronger. So the person that can bow their head, that is humble, that's the most powerful life. That's the strongest life. That's the most dynamic life. And that's what Shin Buddhism teaches us. It's a life of, of deep self-introspection, looking into it ourselves first, more than blaming others. It's easy to see the faults of others. It's so hard to see ourselves. Just a simple example, I went to a buffet restaurant with my wife one time. We're going through the line and I'm noticing this lady ahead of me. And she's just piling on the food. <laughs> she's got this mountain of food. And then at the end of the line, she puts a muffin on top of this pile of food. And then she's sitting at this table over there and I say to my wife, look at the, look at the pile of food that woman has on her plate. And then I look down at my plate, and I've got this pile of food, <laughs> just as big as hers. So hard to see ourselves. So hard to see ourselves. Shin Buddhism is a life of community, a life of sangha. You know, people feel a sense of isolation and, and 
being alone. But if we're part of a Sangha, we're never alone. And we're even trying to create virtual Sanghas now. People who live in parts of the country, there's no Chin Buddhist temple close by. There's no Buddhist temple of any kind close by. And I have a once a month gathering with those people. And now we're building a, a virtual Sangha, a virtual Sangha. Shin Buddhist life is, is a life of always having meaning and fulfillment in life. A wonderful professor of Shin Buddhism, Professor uh, Dae Kaneko, lived the last two years of his life basically kind of bedridden, like an invalid. But he said, those last two years of my life taught the most about gratitude. I have to depend on other people to do everything for me bathe me, feed me, clothe me. He said, I learned so much in these last two years of my life about gratitude. You might think, gee, what a terrible way to live. You're bedridden, you're an invalid. But the Shin Buddhists always, always has meaning in their life. The Shin Buddhist life is a life of the Bodhisattva, to strive for the enlightenment of all beings, not just your own, living in service to others, the life of the bodhisattva. And it's a life of awakening, realization of truth, of the Dharma. Quite often visitors and college students that come, they're in a world religion class, they always ask the question, what do Buddhists believe? And I always say, it's not so much what we believe, it's what we have awakened to. We emphasize awakening, realization. That is the focus in Buddhism. And it is a life of bringing wisdom and compassion to the world. And doesn't our world need more wisdom and compassion? So I think that Chin Buddhism has a lot to offer this country. Uh, I would like to love to see our sanghas uh, you know, grow uh, and share uh, our teachings with others and that others might find this fulfilling life of Shin Buddhism uh, that we have known about for, for, for centuries. Uh, but that will be our challenge, to present it in a way that resonates with people in this country, in this environment, in this time, even with an eight and a half second attention span. <laughs> so we gotta get their attention quickly and then share the message. So let me, uh, conclude with just, Shin Buddhism is focused on Namu Amida Butsu or the Nimbutsu. Uh, I think it could be translated as, I bow my head to the truth of enlightenment, which is great wisdom and great compassion. Thank you very much. Do I stay here? Oh, okay. <laughs>